Uh, hi, uh, I'm Chris Carrick, and uh, my talk today is sort of an excerpted part of my master's thesis, so if you like this, look forward to that. Um, I think my department puts them online for free, so you should check that out um, at MIT. Reach me on Twitter at FFUOK, or my website, ccarrick.com, or just by talking to me, Flesh Chris. Uh, my talk today is about breaking systems, both uh, why it's important to do it, why it's difficult to do it, and closing with looking forward with some ways to deal with that problem of its uh, necessity and difficulty. So, without further ado, let me show this picture. It's a great picture of me. Uh, all right. So, um, it's hard to break digital systems. Uh, this is especially true of public-facing social media platforms, which are especially relevant here at Theorizing the Web, but it's broadly true of many other kinds of digital digital systems. I won't get too deep into what it actually means to be broken here at this talk, but for the purposes of this talk, let's uh, say it means uh, unintentional behavior from the perspective of some party, not just the negation of effect or, you know, um, some canonical brokenness. It's perspectival. Um, there are a lot of other things I could define, like system and algorithm, but I'm, but I'm going to take a leap and assume we're okay on those. <laughs> uh, so one thing that impedes the breaking of systems is that they are about this obfuscated. <laughs> um, for both, uh, uh, they're often obfuscated, and it's hard to break something if you don't know how it works. Uh, for both security and intellectual property concerns, companies have a vested interest in making how their systems work hard to understand. Uh, this happens in a lot of different ways with server side calculations, NDAs, compiled code. There's a lot of different methods that this is achieved. Uh, to actually make a system usable, uh, companies will often release something that is known as for this really basic APIs. <laughs> However, when your only access to a system is through APIs, breaking a system is like trying to perform a task of manual dexterity through several layers of gloves. It may be possible with extreme skill, but it's not accessible to the layman. APIs are a techno-discursive limiting of the potential of digital platforms in that way. Uh, so even when something does skip through, slip through this obfuscation and API armor, uh, high-level programming languages have something called oh boy, error handling. Uh, it's, which, uh, which captures most breaks and errant behavior and whisks it away safely, uh, preventing them from have any, having any real uh, interesting effects. And even if the break does have some kind of interesting effect, as people like uh, Nick Siever, Helen Eisenbaum, and others have written, systems and algorithms are notoriously slippery subjects. They can be personalized, A-B tested, or just straight up changed without issuing oh, this one. any kind of patch notes. This leaves the potential breakdown in question ephemeral and fleeting. It may be only applicable to you because it's personalized. It may be only applicable to 50% of users because it's A-B tested, or it just may be totally changed and removed in a, a week, a month, or a year. Uh, so hopefully I've established that there are many obstacles in the way to successfully and interestingly breaking any digital system, more or less. So let me back up a bit and address kind of a more foundational question here. Why would we want to break these systems in the first place? Well, we can follow this idea back to uh, Norbert Wiener, pictured, uh, and the birth of modern cybernetics in the late 40s and early 50s. Specifically of note is uh, Wiener's idea of feedback. Fe Wiener's feedback is based on the idea that systems can be, be improved not only by working on them theoretically, uh, but also by measuring and responding to their actual physical performance. This idea is caught up in corporate and military practice, obviously, as I'm indicating in this quote here. Um, most of the examples of feedback in this book are uh, for military applications such as uh, aligning artillery gun targeting systems. Uh, but, and as such, the improvement to those systems generated by that kind of feedback would be military or government secrets and therefore not beneficial to the public. Um, since then, the physical performance part of this idea of feedback has been reconceptualized by some groups as breakdown of the system. Groups of people have been able to extract benefits from analyzing breakdowns, and these benefits extend outside the corporate ownership of the systems that are broken. Uh, corporate software testing is a direct descendant of Wiener's feedback. Those are people breaking systems for the ultimate benefit of their bosses, so it doesn't really apply to that. Uh, but there are also groups like speedrunners of video games or hacktivists who extract extra corporate insight and analysis from the breakdown of systems. They serve as models for the potential value and knowledge that can come from breaking a digital system. So. How do we align this agony and ecstasy, as I framed it for this talk? Uh, so there are a few ways to reconcile the difficulty in breaking systems and the fact that it's very, very beneficial to do so. Uh, 
Uh, one straightforward and common sense answer to this problem is just uh, high level study and expertise. Uh, this complex and ever changing problem could just require high levels of proficiency and training and so on and so forth. Uh, but there are of course like limitations to this, uh, this method as has been noted by data journalists like Nicholas Giacopoulos. This work is extremely time and labor intensive. It's very costly to employ methods like reverse engineering, and even more costly to redeploy them in a week or a month when the subject of inquiry has been changed. Further, because of the dedication and cost associated with this inquiry, this research is often dedicated to a lowest common denominator public or imagined user. In reality, there are many different intersecting publics that use these kinds of digital and online platforms, and any kind of analysis like this can only s partially serve these specific publics. Uh, this is not aligned super well, but... Uh, for, for example, deconstructing how Facebook creates its ad targeting means very different things to the activist group organizing on Facebook and the artists who use Facebook itself as a medium. One group may care about what factors determine what ads show up alongside their events, and the other group may care about what, uh, discovering, per what partic discovering particular practices for modifying or gaming ads. They are both valid publics, but they have very different needs when it comes to deconstructing Facebook. The uh, latter one is by Ari Gato, an artist on Facebook, uh, which I've used with his permission. Okay. These are both valid, but there will never be a ProPublica article. Oh, man. That looks like this. I made this fake ProPublica article as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, for the record, I think that the reverse engineering and tech reporting done by organizations like ProPublica is important and irreplaceable. Um, but what I'd like to close with instead is a suggestion for a supplemental kind of breaking that complements that kind of deeper analysis. I call this framework critical breaking. Starting from Donna Haraway's concept of situated knowledge, critical breaking is short term, situated, and allows for local immediate analysis and critique, but does not aspire to totality of the system. And it emphasizes breakdowns that are located in slices and small moments of systems, localizing critique without speaking conclusively on the larger system as a whole. The difference here is between saying this facial recognition system does not echo recognize X kind of faces versus saying this facial recognition system did not recognize X face, Y face, and Z face on this day. Critique can still be done in the latter case, but it is framed and situated and localized to specific events. Uh, this small localized breaking may also provide a way for groups to analyze systems themselves in a way that serves their particular values and interests. I could go on speaking about what the future of critical breaking could be or further explaining it through case studies, but that is a task better suited to a master's thesis <laughs> than a short talk here. So I'd suggest reading mine. Uh, so if I've set this up right, clicking this bottom link should crash this web browser. Thank you. Does it work? Uh, well, let's try. Yeah, it's kind of one of those things where you can only find by trying to actually do anything with it. Um, I think it worked. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Chris. Um, our next presenter is Jeff Schulenberger. Uh, he's presenting a paper called, or presentation, We Are All Targeted Individuals Now. Uh, Jeff is a lecturer in the expository writing program at NYU. His writing has appeared in the New Inquiry, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Descent, and other publications. So, there you go. You guys have Okay. I mean, I, I can also just. 
everybody. Um, so I'll be talking today about a online subculture that um, some of you may have heard of called Targeted Individuals, or TIs. I'll be using the uh, abbreviated version quite a lot. So um, Targeted Individuals is the shared self-designation of a diffuse online subculture of people who believe they're the victims of systematic campaigns of harassment. The abuses they report take a variety of forms. And this is one of many images that circulate widely um, in websites devoted to this community or subculture. So um, this is breaking down their probably most commonly used um, terms, um, which I'll try to unpack a little bit. So uh, TIs assert that Networks of strangers are banding together to follow and harass them in their everyday lives. So this is what they call gang stalking. Um, they also um, claim generally that, quote, direct energy weapons, which you saw um, abbreviated to DO or DW up there, um, are being used against them um, and are often uh, claimed to be channeled through satellites and cell phone towers and that they cause headaches and other bodily ailments, um, as well as uh, auditory and visual hallucinations. Um, another technology they discuss is um, what they call V2K, voice to skull, which um, involves the direct transmission of voices into the mind. And finally, um, they discuss mind control technologies, which they tend to trace to the CIA's MK Ultra program, um, which at least officially was discontinued in 1973. So um, there's been some response in recent years to the emergence of this community sort of in the mainstream media and commentary. Much of it has been characterized by a kind of moral panic, um, particularly because um, at least two people who consider themselves members of this subculture were involved in um, mass shootings. Um, so. A New York Times article that followed one of these events um, exemplifies this tone of panic, um, and I'll quote from that. These individuals represent an alarming development in the history of mental illness. Thousands of sick people banded together and demanding recognition on the basis of shared paranoias, end quote. So the resemblance between TI's reported experiences and symptoms, sorry, rep between their reported experiences and well-known symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia has dominated public discussion um, of, of this phenomenon. So um, what I would argue is that to simply assert, as a lot of these commentaries do, that TIs are simply undiagnosed schizophrenics ignores the real and deep implications of their self-invention as a quite large collective identity numbering at least in the tens and thousands. Um, specifically by elaborating their own shared meta-language and frame of reference, as we saw a, a small version of in the previous, or in this slide, um, they have developed an explanatory system that has gained enough traction, particularly on the internet, to, circum to simply circumvent psychiatric authority altogether. Um, so to clarify the significance of this shift, I'm rewinding us 100 years um, to two drawings that were produced in psychiatric institutions um, in Europe around 100 years ago. Um, so there, and th these are reasonably famous. Um, this one, if, if you've read Anti-Oedipus, uh, this, this artist is actually referred to in Anti-Oedipus. Um, his name is Robert G, and the other artist is Jakob Mohr. Um, so uh, we don't have to look very cl closely at these to see that they depict people afflicted by what today's TIs would refer to as, quote, electronic harassment, psychotronic torture, um, perhaps involving direct energy weapons of the sort that they um, describe. So, in other words, if we rewind 100 years, um, individuals undergoing these kind of experiences um, did try to express themselves and share those experiences with the world to the extent that they could and with the tools available to them, which in both these cases was really scrap paper. Um, so, but it was very unlikely that these two artists or others like them in that period or earlier would really ever encounter each other's depictions or be able to form some kind of community or shared worldview. Um, and the fact that these have come down to us is somewhat contingent because it has to do with the fact that the um, 
outsider art or Arbru movement um, sort of emerged around this time and that these were heavily valued um, and they both are in collections of, of that kind of art, which was a movement inspired by the European avant-garde, surrealism and things like that. So in other words, on the other hand, these two artists um, would have been almost vanishingly unlikely to encounter each other's work or representations of each other's experiences. Um, obviously, also, they couldn't go online and find a ready-made terminology like the, the one that we just saw, so they had to invent idiosyncratic nomenclatures for describing the instruments of their targeting. So if you read the very small print um, in Moore's drawing, he refers to a, quote, wireless organic positive polar device, while G refers um, in some of his art to an effluvium emanation machine. So they each had their own kind of idiosyncratic vocabulary that they developed to describe this. So now we can compare this to this um, image which circulates widely on TI sites. As you can see, it originated in the year 2000, um, so it's been circulating, floating around the internet for quite a while. Um, and it, it originates on a website that no longer exists, that is now um, disoccupied that nobody seems to use anymore, um, but it's it's reposted endlessly um, um, within this um, community and on the websites um, representing it. So um, it seems to depict similar experiences in some ways to the previous ones. I don't need to. I don't have time to get into a detailed comparison, um, but it's depersonalized and technical, or at least pseudo technical. I mean, it has no identifiable author or artist behind it. It's lost the kind of personality and idiosyncrasy of the previous images. And it was created as an explanatory tool, not of one individual's experiences, but of um, for general circulation and use. Um, so if we imagine the Jakob Moores and Robert G's of today, um, instead of these incredibly detailed and painstaking drawings, we can speculate they might simply find a diagram like this online, there are many others, and um, that would um, sort of obviate the sui generis efforts like the ones we just saw. And it would also offer a kind of alternative to medicine's explanatory regime and sort of technical meta-language, uh, sort of different meta-language that is closer to the way they themselves experience um, these, these um, episodes of targeting and passivity and so on. So um, there have been just a few medical studies of the TI phenomenon, and um, probably the most interesting one is uh, from over 10 years ago now. And it points out that um, the implications of this phenomenon are really quite radical and, um, and destabilizing for psychiatric authority, um, especially through the elaboration of terminology and things like the DSM, right? So um, the medical study points out um, that it raises the existence of this community, this very large global community, raises difficulties for the very concept of a delusion as it's defined by the DSM. So um, it states the fact that individuals can form a community based on the content of a potentially delusional belief presents a paradox for the DSM diagnostic criteria of a delusion. This is because the DSM criteria indicate that it should not include any beliefs held by a person's quote subculture or subculture. So if a delusion becomes the, the basis for a shared worldview held by tens of thousands of people, it ceases to be a delusion, at least technically, in the current DSM definition. So the study concludes that, quote, the internet may enable complex support mechanisms without reference to a view of reality held by the authorities or even the mainstream of opinion. So in here, I, d I disagree with, uh, with the authors of that study, because once you get past the alienating jargon, the TI worldview actually draws very heavily upon what we might call the mainstream of opinion, using their phrase, or at least on various mainstream discourses. Indeed, I would argue that the TI literature reveals that consensus reality and beliefs defined medically as delusional have argu arguably never been closer to each other, at least in modern times. So just some examples of this. Um, as we saw already, TI's most common points of reference are drawn from the known historical record. So as the ultimate prototype of what they describe as gang stalking, they cite the COINTEL program, the, the FBI's um, 1960s program of, of targeting individuals, effectively. Um, the CIA's MKUltra mind control experiments um, are also a co constant point of reference and are really filtered into their discourse in part by the fact that they've been represented heavily in popular culture. So um, they also refer uh, 
to a wide range of known present-day realities drawn from the news as examples of the reality of organized targeting, surveillance, and harassment. So in some sites, they refer to the systemic police violence against African Americans in this country as an example of gang stalking and targeting. Um, and they also um, often quote from the Snowden, the Snowden leaks. So in other words, many of the elements that make up their worldview also figure in most non-TI's worldviews. So there isn't so much of a divergence from mainstream opinion. So um, what's, inter what's interesting here is not simply that the internet has allowed TI's to find each other, communicate, and establish a shared frame of reference. It's also that they inhabit a social and political world that um, offers ample grounds for reasonable, and this is kind of the normalization of paranoia as I would regard it in their discourse. It's full of pop culture references and so on. Um, so it, it, they live in a world that offers grounds for reasonable paranoia, both in terms of what's on the news and in the historical record, and in the paranoid visions that saturate our popular culture. So um, while many observers worry that TIs are simply reinforcing each other's paranoia by banding together online, the actual world they live in is doing ju just as much to reinforce it. So um, I'll have to cut this short here, but um, my argument relies on the idea that they're two parallel processes at work here, one of which, it's an awkward phrase, but which I call the paranoiaization of reality, and the other of which I call the normalization of paranoia, which is that their discourse is actually not very far from recognizable mainstream discourses. So, um, and this involves a number of things, including the fact that they draw on heavily on anti-government libertarianism, that their writings are often in this very recognizable self-help mode, and so on. So um, this, is, this is starting to get us to what I think is the real significance of this phenomenon. Um, and again, I'll have to cut it short a little bit here, but um, something I find um, significant is that their, their heavy borrowings from popular culture means that, interestingly, despite their paranoia, it's often directed at things that are the same, that represent the same kind of obtusity of um, our general culture about the current realities and changing realities of surveillance. So um, I'll close by saying that um, TIs, like most of us, have not yet adjusted their fears to a new reality in which, as Wendy Chun has put it, we no longer experience the visible yet unverifiable gaze of surveillance, but a network of non-visualizable digital control. Or to quote um, Siva Vijanathan, um, who I've put up on the slide, surveillance is so pervasive that it's almost impossible for the object of surveillance to assess how he or she is being manipulated or threatened by powerful institutions gathering and using the record of surveillance. The threat is that subjects will become so inured and comfortable with the network status quo that they will gladly sort themselves into niches that will enable more pr effective profiling and behavioral prediction. So this is where I'd say that the creation of a global online community of TIs illustrates the risk that um, Vaidyanathan is talking about here, which is that they have created such a niche, um, particularly because they've been identified as involved in mass shootings. It's very likely that um, simply in sharing their experiences online, they're actually exposing themselves to invisible forms of surveillance. Um, so I'm not the first to observe that Self-designated TIs ironically have used technology to build a community around a shared fear of technology. But in this way, they're merely like many of us today, paranoid but not sure what exactly they should be paranoid about. That's all. Thank you. Sorry for going Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Kate Minnell. Um, she co-authored a paper with her colleague who is sleeping in Australia right now, Robert Fortas. Um, Kate Minnell is a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne, Australia. Her doctoral research explores how people manage their social availability over mobile messaging, and her research interests include technology resistance, mobile media, and the everyday use of digital communication. Would you like this microphone on the stand? <laughs> 
When we talk about online privacy, we often do this by reference to some idea of individual rights. My right to privacy, your right to privacy, and the things that you and I can do to defend those rights. This rhetoric around privacy is as prevalent in the news as it is within social media platforms themselves. The idea that Robbie and I want to suggest today is that this discourse of individual rights is only valuable up to a certain point with regards to social media platforms, and that it is of growing importance that we find ways to move beyond it. In short, the concept of individual rights doesn't sufficiently protect us on the web because the concept of the individual doesn't accommodate for the way that data mining targets social networks. Social media is becoming important as a form of identification that goes beyond just reducing, reproducing so-called real-world sociality. Social media is important for social lives, yes, but it is also necessary for public participation of other kinds. Workplaces use social media profiles when recruiting employees, and more recently, border control personnel can request access to social media accounts as a security measure. Having a well-curated social media presence then is fast becoming much more than a social luxury. In the opposite direction, Castells identifies how being part of a network of most kinds will almost always be of greater benefit than cost, irrespective of your place within that network. One example of this, both Robbie and I are immigrants to Australia, and social media provides us with a way to connect with distant friends. So the problems of privacy that we wish to address today are not necessarily resolved by opting out of social media. Social media technologies such as Facebook and Twitter have value. They enable individuals to communicate with each other, to formalize real world relationships and to build new relationships. Opting out of social media may involve significant cost. Laura P Portwood Stacer makes this point in some detail during her discussion of media refusal and care work. She notes that rejecting social media is a tactic of resistance that is not equally available to everyone. A call for rejecting social media then will only go so far and will only be a solution for some people. Even changing behavior within social media platforms is difficult given the social benefits that they provide. Accordingly, the management of social media is necessary for dealing with the multiple contexts of social life and the unpleasant but frequent experience of context collapse. This management of our social media is one expression of the idea of a right to pri of privacy. Sorry. Privacy is complex. Private information sits somewhere between a total secret and public information. Our management of the secretness or publicness of individual bits of personal information is the cornerstone of privacy. The right to privacy is an international principle founded in Article 12 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It states that we have an innate right to control the context for information about ourselves. Despite this, though, it is common sense now that our data is not particularly under our control anymore. Indeed, social media platforms require that we transfer some rights to them in order to participate in these platforms. It is also common knowledge <clears throat> that these platforms mine data from our profiles as a core business model. Many scholars, including Daniel Solov, Finn Brunton, Helen Nissenbaum, have done excellent work identifying methods for managing privacy in the face of vigorous data extraction by these social media giants. In a post-Snowden era then, we're aware that privacy is important. It seems to be our last resort when facing scrutiny by the different institutions that manage our lives. Our data can be breached on a whim by the state and is subject to all manner of potential data mining projects by corporations, not to mention the practice of doxing and other forms of online harassment that operate through personal data exposure. To address these problems, we often look to the idea of a right to privacy. The right to privacy is an established principle that guides the creation of privacy-related legislation and policy, for instance, in laws articulating the idea of a right to be forgotten. In other cases, the right to privacy can usually only operate as a legal recourse after a breach, as opposed to protection against disclosure. This rights discourse also takes non-legal forms in comment wars on the internet as a complaint against perceived future breaches and in individual attempts to renegotiate the terms and conditions of Facebook via pseudo-legal status updates. <laughs> 
Beyond these legal and pseudo-legal frameworks, the discourse of individual rights often gets used by privacy advocates and activists in the forms of calls for people to act in defense of their online privacy, or what Daniel Solov calls enacting privacy self-management. Examples of this include the guidelines provided by the Electronic Frontier Foundation and by the WNYC podcast Note to Self in their recent privacy project. Academic work, too, tends, to, tends toward positioning the individual as the driving force of resistance. Work by Brunton and Nissenbaum on the importance of ob obfuscation articulates a range of tactics useful for people wanting to avoid the watchful eyes of state and corporation. These ideas are compelling and valuable, but like so much of the advice on resisting surveillance, they focus on the privacy of the individual and position self-management as the primary means of protecting this privacy. To begin thinking beyond this individual mode of privacy, we believe it's important to distinguish between two forms of social media practices that can be categorized by the types of labor that go into them. The first is an individual labor, which describes the work that goes into producing, shaping, and maintaining a profile, treating the personal page like a gallery, which has photos, statements, personal information, all of which are to some extent representations of the self. The second form of labor is a social labor, which works to connect individual labor to other contexts, to build the profile out to other social settings, map connections to other profiles. Social labor is identifiable through following and being followed, through friending, liking, tagging, hashtagging, and other similar practices that make use of the formal codes within platforms to generate connections between profiles. The main issue Complicating this privacy schema is the fact that the focus for privacy has tended to be on the outputs produced through individual labor. This is understandable. In many regards, personal posts are like a diary. They account for feelings, behaviors, experiences. They include personal references or are perhaps context specific. They are in short very private and the protection of this material is important. A rights framework may even be quite useful for protecting this material with private corporations like Google and Facebook uh, supposedly taking steps like preventing direct profile access for employees. Our concern is, however, that the products of social labor are the primary targets for data extraction on the web. Individual personal information is not the focus of data extraction, personal networks are. The connections that we build with each other between ourselves and other nodes on social media networks are a significant focus of big data research and analysis. And these aspects have not been the subject of significant rights discourses. We argue that this limitation is a product of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights emerging out of a liberal framework of individual protections. Because network data is data about social relationships rather than purely personal information, the data itself is social data rather than individual data. One example of this is the way that Facebook renders a friendship as a binary state that cannot be directly identified as property owned by any one party. The social nature of this information places it outside of the purview of a liberal notion of individual rights. In his account of the relationship between classical liberalism and democracy, Noberto Bobbio observes that liberalism was founded as a political philosophy that would protect the individual against institutions, where increases in personal liberty could only be assured through a reduction in the powers of the institutions that governed us. But Benjamin Constant and John Locke had no conception of social media, and social media as an institution is not reduced by increases in our freedom. Quite the contrary, our freedoms provide more data, more material, and more value for these platforms. These institutions wish for us to have more and more freedom within the confines of their platforms, but this does not reduce their power and instead increases the resources, information, and capacities of these platforms at an exponential rate. Accordingly, if we want to think about protections, we can't rely solely on the framework of individual liberal rights. The idea of the human that is implied by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is over 70 years old. The human it implies was never understood as someone who would willingly give massive amounts of personal information to a large number of global media companies. Equally, the idea of the institution itself has changed. 
there was an idea that institutions limited freedom and the idea of global corporate conglomerates attempting to not only provide but accelerate the degree to which people use their services was never really considered. <coughs> Our idea of rights is limited not only because it fails to account for the new social ways that data is extracted from people, but also because its model of individuals and institutions is somewhat out of date. Furthermore, in an age where disruption is seen as a necessary part of technological innovation, a legal framework for protecting individuals is unlikely to be a substantial solution into the future. Instead, we need to develop new frameworks that complement privacy rights by supporting privacy materially through practices and protocols. Essentially, the problem is a social one. It is social both in the sense that it is our social interactions that are mined, and in the sense that the social value of these platforms make opting out unrealistic. We need a solution, then, that takes the social into account, a social model of privacy. Having identified this need, Robbie and I have been uh, conceptualising how a social model of privacy could perhaps be enacted. Firstly, we need to increase our awareness of how we compromise the privacy of ourselves and others online by thinking not only in terms of the self, but also thinking in terms of the social. By reframing our online safety discourses around a social model of privacy, we can also begin having conversations about privacy practices that aren't founded in an abstinence model. We also need to change our thinking on rights. Yes, we should retain individual rights to privacy, but we also need to start conceptualising rights for collectives online, and we need to see about developing these into sensible and coherent frameworks for governance. Finally, we need to start thinking about embedding our solutions in the technology that we're using so that we're not trying to wrestle our needs against the platforms that we share. A social model of privacy calls for new forms of social media based in protocols and data standards that prioritise controlled sharing rather than in centralised platforms that deal with ownership first and community second. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have our second Kate up now. Um, she's presenting a presentation called Predicting Abuse, UK Child Protection Practitioners, Information Use, and the Adoption of Predictive Technologies. And Kate is a doctoral student at the Oxford Internet Institute, focusing on anti-rape technologies as an intersection of higher education, metrics, and politics of safety. Do you want this mic? Um, Do you want to? I can see. Okay. okay. We'll see how this works. Great. Um, thank you. Um, so before I start, I just want to preface by saying that I'll be discussing um, quotes and showing images that pertain to child protection issues. Um, so, so far, my colleagues here have provided us with theoretical frameworks for thinking about privacy, and I want to invite you all to switch gears into considering the context of UK child protection services and see how these themes of privacy arise. So in the past decade, we've seen an increasing turn towards big data-driven predictive technologies in various sectors that range from health and finance to elections and policing. Increasingly, social work, too, is considering similar technologies. So in this following talk, I draw from my qualitative research um, on master's program to examine predictive tools in child protection services. One of the defining characteristics of child protection policy in the UK is a haunting legacy of child deaths. The deaths of Victoria Klimbier in 2000 and Baby P in 2007 incited national outrage. And critics highlighted the lack of coordination between relevant agencies and the reluctance to intervene pro uh, proactively as major forces that contributed to the deaths. Lord Lemming, who was commissioned to review both cases, actually found that both children had at various points come into contact with uh, social workers, doctors, teachers, and police officers, but in the absence of anyone taking a proactive approach, these cases fell through the cracks and the children were overlooked. And he described both cases as, quote, significant missed opportunities. 
So in an effort to prevent these missed opportunities, there was an increasing focus on using technology and collecting better, faster, more comprehensive information. Um, so there were various technological approaches. One that's quite telling is Contact Point, which was established after Klimbier's death. Um, that's essentially a database of every single child that had ever come across social services contact. Uh, it cost 224 million pounds to set up, 41 million pounds yearly to maintain until it was terminated in 2010. Electronic assessment tools were also created and multi-agency um, information sharing hubs were created called the MASH. But as budget cuts increase, public scrutiny intensify, and workload accumulate, there are now efforts to develop predictive technologies. And the UK is not alone, actually. In 2012, the Hillsborough County in Florida tried this, Los Angeles County in 2014. In 2015, New Zealand is also tinkering with the model, and South Korea is also considering as well. So at the MASH, uh, again, multi-agency safeguarding hub, is currently developing their own predictive risk assessment models called the PRMs. The MASH is a direct outcome of publicized child deaths and it's designed to create uh, and facilitate faster and better information sharing. Um, and it does this through co-location, which basically is a fancy word for saying, here's like one office building, uh, partner agencies and health, education, drugs and alcohol services, law enforcement, and social work are all housed in the same building. So in the past, you had to like call the health person during lunchtime, be like, hey, I need this information. But if the person's off during lunch, then you have to wait 30 more minutes. Meanwhile, work is piling up. But under co-location, you can just like walk over to the desk over and collect the information. Um, and the idea is that social workers can now collect data um, more comprehensively and therefore they can assess risk more accurately and intervene earlier. So now they want to use the risk factor data gathered from this process to develop a risk assessment model. Which has unsurprisingly led to bifurcated reactions. Some are celebrating as an efficient, proactive strategy and others are lamenting the loss of human touch. But absent in these conversations are the voices of practitioners who actually use information in their day-to-day -day setting. So it, uh, I conducted in-depth observations and interviews of practitioners at the MASH in Oxfordshire um, to identify practical and ethical considerations for adopting predictive technologies. So in this talk, I want to highlight three themes in particular, the accuracy of existing data, the tension between consent and intervention, and the conflict between care and efficiency. And in doing so, I want to propose that small data can sometimes tell us a lot more about big data. So how does this MASH thing work? Um, so in short, MASH is a first point of contact for people who have safeguarding inquiries in public. Um, existing cases go directly to uh, caseworkers, but if it's a new safeguarding inquiry, a MASH administrator processes it, senior social workers triage it by level of urgency, and the remaining cases, social workers collect information through the co-location structure, um, and then they use that information during risk assessment process to assign it to three categories, red for high risk, amber for medium risk, and green for low risk. There are four potential outcomes through the triage process. First, if it's um, urgent cases, they go directly to immediate intervention. Second, they're sent to assessment team, which refer to an off-site team of social workers that go and conduct direct investigations or the families are referred to social services, for example, mental health or rehabilitation. And finally, no further action could be taken if the risk is not high enough. So the first thing I wanna highlight is accuracy. Um, actually, there was a great panel yesterday that really delved into this, so I won't dwell on it too much. Um, but the obvious and immediate question is, how accurate is existing data and how um, will it contribute to accurate predictions? All practitioners agree that information collection through co-location is important because it gives a more holistic picture of the family. But in saying that they caveat, they added a caveat that um, this picture is actually a snapshot at best. One practitioner said, how much information do we actually know about a family? Do we really know that there are no drugs being used? Do we actually really know? I suppose if we were, we don't know that. We've got a very small snapshot of the family that comes through our door. So the picture is actually a snapshot at best. And this snapshot, all it tells us is that a family was vulnerable at one point in so-and-so ways. 
So this means that the snapshots may accumulate, but even in accumulation, it's over-concentrated with extreme vulnerabilities and completely lacking in the kind of day-to-day -day challenges that families might face. And practitioners said, because there's such a stereotype of social workers as people who just come into the family and take your children away, people who might actually need the kind of day-to-day -day support um, do not reach out to social services. So the data they have is forever patchy. Um, and my conclusion is that the predictions that this tool might make are actually going to be patchy at best as well. Uh, during the information collection process, there emerges a tension between consent and intervention. On one hand, practitioners have to ask for consent so that they can be ethical public servants. But on the other hand, they have an obligation to act immediately. And this creates an ongoing tension between these two themes during the information collection process. So how they actually get consent is that um, they rely on the girl snail mail. Um, so they send out a mail requesting for consent to share information. And if they don't receive anything in three working days, then they, uh, then they uh, assume affirmative consent and go ahead with it. Um, <laughs> Um, and social workers are actually very much torn apart on this part as well. Some thought, you know, like, we have a child that might be in danger, we cannot wait, um, we've done our fair share, we've sent the request, but we haven't heard anything back, so we're going to go ahead with it. But other practitioners expressed um, deep reluctance and concern as well. One practitioner in particular said, Eight out of 10 times when you speak to parents afterwards, they're like, I didn't even know it's been shared with you. I didn't even know it was going to be reported to social services. And then describes how oftentimes when these kind of sensitive data are collected from families, they're under extreme duress. So they might not be aware that they have actually given consent or aware of all the complexities um, of their data sharing. Um, so yeah, they might not remember that, and it's not the right state of mind for them to agree to those things at that point. So I think, unless I actually feel that I need those partner agencies for definite, I will try and wait until I have the parents' consent. Another complexity um, in this information collection process is a different standards of ethics. So there are various agencies in the same office building. Social workers are a bit more flexible. Partner agencies are a bit more harsh about their data ethics. And finally, law enforcement is the most forceful. So this means that it creates an environment where um, when a case comes in, police officers and social workers are kind of putting a lot of pressure on partner agencies to share information. Um, and because partner agencies actually report to their respective agencies, they're under different standards of ethics and are not always able to share the information because if they did, then that's a breach of privacy and they could lose their jobs. How this actually manifests in observation is that um, if a case comes in and social workers and police officers want information, they'll like stand next to the partner agency person and demand information, which of course the partner agency person can't tell you because then they get fired. Um, but what I observed is that they would say things like, I can't tell you X, Y, Z for these reasons, but instead, if I were in your position, I would consider A, B, or C. So we see these kind of implicit ways of sharing information that takes place in this context. Um, um, so the third theme I want to highlight during the risk assessment process is the tension between care and efficiency. I think looking at the risk factor data is actually quite helpful. Sorry, there you go. So um, because this predicted risk assessment model will be based on risk factor data, which actually social workers didn't collect before, it's only after they want to create this risk assessment tool that they're having to collect extensive risk factor data. They use a software called Framework I, and this is just kind of a janky visualization I made, but it goes on from risk factor one to all the way to 30. And each factor has one for the guardian and one for the child. So if we look at mental health, it's mental health for parent currently, mental health for uh, child currently, mental health for parent in the past, mental health for child in the, pa um, in the present. So then you have to tick all the boxes for nearly 30 risk factors that are present in the, um, in the software. And regarding this, the social worker said, oh my god, there are so many risk factors and everything is a risk factor. It's a lot of work for us in each case to skim through to that extent. And this actually raises a second point as well, which is that what's considered a risk factor is reflective of changing social norms. 
the software has LGBT as a risk factor and lone parent as a risk factor. Now, I think it's a bit harsh to have that because in itself, it's not a risk factor. It becomes one in conjunction with other things. So I could have a case where it leads to no further action, but because I have to collect the data, I'm going to have to mark lone parent and that the child is homosexual on, um, on the software and I would have to tick those boxes. So overall, practitioners express great degree of ambivalence, which brings us to the slide we started with. Um, some celebrated as a proactive, preventative gesture. Others lamented it as a data exercise. One social worker in particular said, I've been doing this for 10 years. Every so often, I have to learn this new skill um, or a new tool, and they never stick around. Um, I'm, I'm just going to have to do it because the higher-ups want me to do it. Um, and I think this doubt was a lingering, um, lingering consideration among social workers is that you could have all the risk factors and a family might be vulnerable, but not necessarily abused. And it would be difficult for an algorithm to measure that. So as I conclude this talk, I just want to suggest that this qualitative small data approach of really delving into the organizational context of this child protection agency illustrated that, that there it really is a material need for something more efficient and standardized, but at the same time, um, how this tool would work when the data is so patchy, risk assessment process so difficult, and work environment can be so very tense. So as we look for continuation of this kind of research, I want to propose that one interesting way would be looking at how communities' relationship to local services might alter when they find out that the decisions about their ch uh, children's safeguarding has been made on basis of risk assessment tools. Thank you. Thank you. Let's have another round of applause for everyone's presentation. Okay, so we have 20 minutes to talk. Um, I have a question about, I guess all of your presentations or a lot of them talked about the ideas of communities. Um, and my question is like, uh, there's kind of a narrative, I guess, of like, in a lot of communities that haven't been represented, there's this kind of like neoliberal narrative on like visibility is a good thing or whatever. And does visibility is it not always a good thing? Can it create vulnerability? And, and just thinking about the different issues in your specific, specific presentations, like uh, how do you think, I guess, communities relate to those issues of vulnerability and visibility? Um, yeah, and I guess a lot of you talk about tension in individual community kind of thing, so, yeah. So I think that, that um, tension is really significant in the case that I was discussing. Um, so uh, the argument I was, I had to sort of cut it short, but the main argument I was trying to make at the end was that um, ironically, the, um, the very act of gathering together and sharing experiences and sort of cre creating these websites and forums and so on is, um, I would argue, probably rendering um, people involved in this community more vulnerable in many ways. Um, and what's interesting is that you know, their, uh, their, their sort of imaginary, their, their way of um, visualizing and understanding the ways that they're targeted um, doesn't really account for that um, for various reasons, but I think partly because the larger culture that they're sort of absorbing their representations from doesn't account for it very well either. Um, so that is, is absolutely a, a sort of key tension that the, the very act of um, sharing these experiences of being targeted, I would argue, especially because of these highly publicized and I think, you know, in some ways very distorting um, ways that they've been associated with that, you know, mass shootings and so on, is likely to be rendering them vulnerable to all sorts of surveillance. Um, but again, because, um, well, I'll, I'll leave it there, but yeah, that absolutely describes it. Sure. Um... So I guess where communities factor into my presentation were communities organizing to have their particular values and interests in digital platforms that they're involved in being realized in some way um, through breaking practice. And I think um, that's probably where I would just kind of make those connections. Like um, it's important, like the visibility narrative kind of doesn't apply because 
being involved in a digital platform, you're visible to the algorithms, even if you're not visible like as a public like organization or whatever. And um, what I was trying to get at through my presentation is that it is important to get results for your community. Like the visibility as like a public thing is not as important as, as getting the results through some kind of practice. And um, yeah, that's all. Um, this point is maybe like only tangentially related to the to the particular argument that Robbie and I were making in that paper, but um, there is an argument that gets made quite convincingly, I think, in a lot of um, contemporary literature on privacy, which is that it has benefits for communities, not just for individuals. So often when we think about privacy in an individualistic manner, we're thinking about like the benefits for me, right? I don't want people to see the like naked pictures of me online or I don't want my social security number um, being publicized or because of those kind of um, individual harms and then the individual benefits that you have from privacy. But I think it's also important to keep in mind the kind of value that privacy has for communities collectively, right? And we can think about things like intellectual and creative um, development of communities through, through privacy existing at a kind of broader level as well. So when we're thinking about privacy as a kind of social and collective issue, it's good to keep in mind that it also has benefits for for communities as well. There's a scholar, a law scholar um, called Woodrow Hartzog who makes this argument in a much more articulate way than I am right now, so I, I highly recommend going and looking at some of his work on this. Um, yeah, I think in context of child protection, this is an especially tricky issue because you become visible through your vulnerability. Um, and I don't think it's a challenge to say that people face various kinds of vulnerabilities in their daily lives, but it's that in these softwares under the duress of um, policymakers and increasing public scrutiny, it's that these families are forever frozen in their state of vulnerability. So they exist in the archive of information collection as, you know, high risk, extremely vulnerable families, even though in their long life trajectory of various highs and lows, they have all these lives and dreams and experiences, but that's not necessarily captured. And also the tools that we're interested in, like predictive risk assessment tools that only gives you, you know, these are the risk factors. It's not interested in complementing that by looking at, for example, what are the strength factors? Maybe this family was able to arise through various social circumstances because of the strength of having a single mother who was really driven or because this was a really tight-knit family group. Um, so I think, it's not necessarily the documentation of vulnerability, but the fact that it is completely absent from other uh, circumstances that are not really considered when you collect information. I also have a follow-up just for your thing too. Is there, is with the predictive technologies, is there issues of just like certain communities like race or you brought up like LGBT, like is there issues of discrimination with these kind of predictive technologies, like certain communities being targeted basically by data? Yeah, definitely. And I think recent uh, research on predictive policing in the U.S. is a really great example. Um, in particular, in this agency, um, there was an interest in developing this predictive tool in conjunction with hotspot mapping. So we see this kind of interesting idea of vulnerability is actually physically rooted, and we're going to look at specific neighborhoods. And of course, I think in this crowd, I can kind of safely, vaguely say that you know, neighborhood histories are extremely intertwined and um, class disparities um, that that came through social workers' conversations with me, but I don't think it would, you know, for example, race wasn't documented in the risk factor data um, and class wasn't documented, but there are other risk factors that operate as proxies. Um, so even though we don't have explicit declaration of those things as vulnerabilities, it's something that comes through and it's, um, and again, it's not just documentation, it's what gets done in whose name with it. Um, and I think the predictive policing conversation in this country has been really um, illustrative of that. Do we have any audience questions? Yes. I think it, we use the mic, right? So everyone can hear. Um. Oh, I don't know.
Okay, you'll get picked up by this thing. Oh, okay. Thank you for all your presentation. I've uh, got a question for Jeff. Um, it's about um, kind of other online communities that are self diagnosed but aren't recognised by the medical bodies. With the targeted ind individuals, have you seen any kind of recognition of those kind of sister communities? And if so, are there any acts of collaboration or maybe hostility or claims of legitimacy that are kind of um, or discussions around that between those communities? Yeah, there's both. Uh, there's, on one hand, a a definite overlap with many of those communities, um, including uh, electromagnetic hypersensitivity. I mean, there's a large overlap there. Um, although, obviously, the narrative is different, right? Because it 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 doesn't um, the electromagnetic hypersensitivity doesn't have this um, sense of reference, right? Of it sort of being direct, the electromagnetism being directed dir towards the individual. But nevertheless, there is a kind of there are cross currents between those communities. Um, there's also Morgellons disease is brought up um, as and is actually sometimes integrated into these narratives that, in fact, one of the forms of targeting is like seeding with Morgellons disease. So there is a lot of overlap, but there is the opposite, which is that you find forums where people are saying, we have to distinguish ourselves clearly from those groups because that will you know, lead people to understand us as, I mean, that, that'll sort of depoliticize our experiences in some ways. So you definitely find both, both the sort of embracing of those narratives as kind of part of this bricolage of different um, ways of sort of understanding and visualizing the experience, but also a kind of attempt to distance, right? And then like within those communities you have, I mean, they're very dispersed and complicated so you, you definitely have a lot of um, claims even that, I don't know, those electromagnetic hypersensitivity people are sort of planted in order to make us look, in order to make us lose credibility. So there's, it definitely goes in both directions. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, back there. Yeah, back there. For the first Kate who spoke, who I'm sorry, I don't remember your last name, but um, one of the things that interests me about shifting privacy discourse away from a vocabulary that's centered on individual rights and, rights and towards the conception of collective ownership is that that sort of opens a door for articulating privacy demands in terms of organizing and direct action rather than appeals to the state or other vertical power institutions. So I was just wondering in your research if you've come across any privacy organizations that are operating within the kind of framework that you're advocating for. A question for Kat, Kate Manel. Thanks. Yeah. Um, maybe to like <clears throat> to to sort of uh, put this paper into context. Um, Robbie and I are just sort of starting to think through this these ideas, and we're we're more at the stage of setting this up as a research project than we are at the stage of actually having like done the research project. Um, so that's certainly something that we would be interested in in, in looking for. Um, I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, but I think uh, some of the things that I've just noticed um, over the time that we've spent kind of starting to develop these ideas is that there are some, um, some kind of interesting examples of people talking about the importance of of privacy as a kind of collective notion. Um, one kind of specific example of this, often uh, one of the kind of problems with an individualistic idea of privacy is that people fall back on this idea that, well, I don't have anything to hide, so there's no reason for me to, um, to take kind of actions to protect my privacy, right? And I think there's been some really good work done on trying to combat that idea um, both in academic literature, so Daniel Solov has written a book on this idea which is really excellent and also quite an accessible kind of read, but also in like more public discourses as well, we're starting to see some kind of like pushback against this idea. Um, I mentioned the Note to Self privacy project that they did recently. Um, there were kind of hints of this idea in, in their in the project that they ran, um, in particularly thinking about the importance of using of using kind of privacy protection um, technologies and mechanisms, not just for your own benefit, but so they become more 
widely used and less like of a red flag, right? That, oh, well, that person obviously has something to hide because they're using encrypted messaging. If everyone uses encrypted messaging, it doesn't mean anything that you're using encrypted messaging. So in terms of specific organizations, no. Um, but in terms of like a slow shifting of, of discourse, I think there are starting to be some interesting things happening. Yes, a question in the back there. Kind of, uh, make a bit of a plug for where I work, but as well as a huge community of privacy organizations around the world. So I work with a group called Tactical Tech. And we did an event in the, um, sorry, we're based in Berlin. We did an event in New York uh, called The Glass Room, which is trying to do this. How do you talk about privacy in a way that's not overly technical or academic and engage with and sort of everyday communities? But there's actually a huge network around the world of people who are trying to do exactly this, so um, I mean, that's just something I wanted to throw out, but also respond to the um, point about um, privacy, not so much just as an individual group, but what is the formation and the context of that group about. So I think that feminist activists working on online harassment are actively doing this when they're trying to say that we need newer conceptions of privacy, um, but also how those groups working on supporting each other to address online harassment um, it's not just that the group has, you know, a specific notion of privacy to the group, but the group maintains and creates ideas of privacy. Um, and I think that that also extends sometimes to communities. So like LGBT groups in different parts of the world that are hyper-visible on Facebook uh, as a way of expressing their identity, especially in places where homosexuality is uh, criminalized, in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. So there's a constant maintenance of privacy as well as your identity at the same time. Time, and that's quite well explored in the literature. So I think there's a lot of kind of layers um, within that to unpack. And also just to say that Jen sitting in the first row actually worked at the glass room. I just realized, sorry to call you Maybe out. Maybe that <laughs> is, uh, violates her privacy. <laughs> but she's actually wearing a glass room t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to Thanks for the Does anyone want to respond to that? OK. Any other questions? Uh, I, well, I think we have more time. Um, I have one about, I guess, do you feel like you guys all have a shared definition of privacy? Is it, is that something, yeah, is that something to, that we should talk about? <laughs> is it, I mean, is it important? To, I, I think those things are, have been redefined, right, in, in, with the internet. I don't. Uh, I don't have a very clear definition. I think it's, it's very hard and it's very in flux and hard to keep up with how it should be defined. But I'm very interested in hearing um, what others have to say on that because it is it is absolutely germane to what I'm trying to figure out. Well, I definitely feel like I fall more on the control side of this panel than the privacy side. So I don't have like a well built out functional definition of privacy that I've been like mobile mobilizing in my research or whatever but um yeah i'd be interested in what the other two have to say <laughs> uh it's such a good question i mean this is like the problem with with like all of our conversations about privacy right is that defining it is so impossible i i stumbled across this paper this like legal paper that was written in like the 90s trying to define privacy just in regards to how it's talked about in legal literature and they went through all the definitions and there was like 50 different like legal definitions of privacy at that time and this is before even some of the developments that we're talking about now so um i think it's good to to ask that question and to kind of keep asking that question. Um, I think the most important thing for me in terms of defining privacy is that a lot of the way that um, like legal regulatory frameworks define privacy is in this very binary way. Either something is private or it's not private, right? Either it's secret or you've told someone and it's not private. Um, and I don't think that that definition works or or helps us at all basically in thinking through these issues i mean in thinking about like the social model of privacy idea uh 
this kind of social labor that we're talking about, right, where you where you like something or you or you make a friendship connection with someone, that's not secret information because automatically there's already at least one other party that knows about the thing because the thing is a connection, right? Um, but we would argue that, that you still should have some claim to control over that information. So this, I think, the most important thing for me is that we steer away from these, these very kind of like binary definitions of something either being private or being public because it's rarely that, that simple. Um, there, Helen Nissenbaum has done some really good work around this, talking about privacy as being about kind of context. I think her work is really useful for this. Um, but yeah, I think of moving away as much as possible from those kind of binary definitions is important. But yeah. Um, yeah, to add to that, um, <coughs> yeah, I, I mean, obviously, um, I, there were lots of gasps and horrors when I show the snail mail photo. So I don't have a good definition of privacy that would apply for all of these different agencies. But I do know what's not a good definition and practice of privacy because we all gasped and um, expressed various degrees of horror. Um, but, and I think that kind of focus on context is really important. And especially in this agency context, we see that actually independent agencies have their own existing data privacy laws and practices. But when you put all of them in the same office building together, that creates a whole new context that requires a new discussion about what should privacy and what should use of sensitive data look like in this particular context. Um, and as we see more of these kind of developed technologically oriented government services emerge, that's the kind of conversation that I don't think is really happening at a, at a localized and specific, and I guess situated, um, as one of my former panelists have said, uh, context. I had an idea about privacy. <laughs> so um, I think the way that I would actually think about privacy in terms of like breaking digital systems is that it's something that is um, kind of enacted computationally, at least in terms of like ad profiles or um, kind of the way corporations see you through your use of social media platforms and that um, breaking digital systems is a way of enacting kind of privacy. And then what I'm thinking about is people have done this technique and I'm sure people here are more familiar with it with, than me, but uh, like fuzzing your profile with like a lot of extra groups and pages and stuff to make it impossible to algorithmically like parse like visually you could maybe figure it out cuz like this person's not interested in whatever or like eggs or something like you know like that's not a real group that they're in but computationally it would be much more difficult to figure out um and so i think that is a way of breaking to tie back to my thing um a uh, way privacy can be it's a way of achieving privacy through breaking computational algor algorithmic um systems yeah, it's it's like yeah, these things don't expect disinformation. They're like not meant to like be weeding out malevolence. And so if you can actually induce that, then you have like broken an expectation higher up in the chain and therefore can enact privacy or more control or whatever you want to call it. Cool. Um well, we have 1 minute left, but uh, I think that no question is going to have an answer less than a minute. Um, so I'm just going to plug that I'm DJing at the Ace Hotel tonight. <laughs> it has to do with uh, Rhizome, so it's new media related. So you can come talk about privacy and control if you'd like. Uh, and let's thank all our panelists. Thank you for coming. Thank you.